All yeah, right, we're live. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. 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 I saw you have done marketing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, quite the, quite cool. the. All right, well, thank you for coming. I know you're really close up here, but we were hoping that you could get a good view yeah. of the scenery he's going to show us from Michigan. And I'm Jamie Sweeney. I am the owner of Juniper Art Gallery. And this is Tim Mulher, our guest author. Thank you for being here to our participants. Um, Tim and I go way back. <laughs> we, we met 1983. No, was it? <laughs> yes, it was 1983. So we've known each other for a long time and we've shared a love of both writing and nature. So that's just had a long friendship so it's so exciting that he's finally been able to put together and his writing is wonderful and putting together this book of essays is wonderful i'm so happy for him and for us to get to read it so i'm just going to give a brief introduction i have to put my eyes on um, tim first visited northwest lower michigan's leelanau and grand traverse counties in 1986 so that was shortly after we met and hasn't been the same since. Meanwhile, he's been keeping field notes of his adventures there, which resulted in this book, Sand Stars, Wind and Water. Um, and, and it's a tribute to this region and its people and an encouragement for visitors to really be respectful of that national area. Hello, Jonathan, welcome. So, Jonathan, Tim O'Haran, Jonathan Kielich. Um, Tim, this is a quote from uh, Dave Dempsey, I thought was a good one. Tim Mulherin takes us on a memorable walk through one of the most beautiful places in America, a place he cherishes and honors with acute observation. And uh, Dave is the author of The Heart of the Lakes, Freshwater in the Past, Present, and Future South, Southeast Michigan. And then I just wanted to add, from my perspective on reading it, although the book is about this location that Tim's come to love in Michigan, it's also, to me, about just being a sense of place whatever place that might be that would resonate with you, I think you can read this book and see it or read it and feel it in the context of a special place that you've wanted to go and visit over the years. So Tim's going to um, talk about his book and also do a few readings, and he's got a little slideshow of the beauty of the area. And I will be quiet and turn it over to Tim. Right. Thanks, Jamie. Mm -hmm. I wish you didn't say it was 38 years. <laughs> 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 it's a long time. It's been great knowing him. Loved her since I met her. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, wonderful that she's having me here. Thanks for coming. So I'll babble as I normally do. I was a college instructor for quite a while, and the students got accustomed to me going. Um, and if you have a question or comment, feel free to just jump in and throw a cat. I'm probably going to sit for most of this, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, so when Jamie talked about, uh, in fact, I ended up naming this the other day. I was, up, I was telling her I was in Ann Arbor in the greater Detroit area, going to libraries and bookstores last week. And a uh, librarian asked me for the title of my presentation. I went, oh, just give me a minute on that, because I didn't have a title. <laughs> but identity, place, and belonging, exploring that up north state of mind. But when Jamie talked, part of what I want to talk about is identity and place, for sure, and a lot of writers do go into that spend many of the, not all the writing time on that because it is fascinating how connected we are to place and through writing you know self-discovery um i just wanted to explore that my, my attachment to this area which i'll share with you you'll see yeah that guy does need to see a psychiatrist or psychiatrist <laughs> um, but i think you relate i mean uh now that i'm recently kind of retired uh, i thought about that too um, one of my happy places is my bed, <laughs> uh, frankly, because at the end of my day, I, just, I get in bed and my wife's there and we're reading and, you know, I don't have stress anymore. I was a, a CEO of a public charter school, K-12 school in Indianapolis for six years. And it's just kind of funny. You, you know, you find those places in your life that you gravitate towards that just make you feel better. So even my bed has become kind of a refuge and uh, so I mentioned I was a, a CEO for a public charter school. I can tell you that being in education is an extremely stressful occupation and uh, working the back of the house as I did. Uh, part of my job was to ensure that teachers and staff didn't know a lot of things that were going on that were pretty difficult to address. And uh, 
I would tell them and some parents who are friends, I said, if you only knew what was going on in schools, you would be afraid to send your kids to school and sometimes you'd probably be afraid to work here. And I'm not saying that to be melodramatic, it's just these are the times we're in. Um, and my job was to keep things safe and sound and everybody as happy as to be. The pandemic occurred. And then in Indianapolis, Marion County, I don't know what's, what the rules have been around here, but um, uh, the Marion County Public Health Department, and I won't spend time on much time on COVID, and the Indiana State Department of Health made recommendations, but it was up to me to make the healthcare decisions for a thousand employees, a thousand students and 110 employees and anybody who visited. Uh, I have a real issue with that because I am not a public health expert or an infectious disease specialist, although one of my colleagues made a nameplate for me with Tim Moher, an MD, PhD, infectious disease specialist. And I really <laughs> cherish that. Idea. Good to but that's the fact of the matter. And you could go to a school, you can go to a school in Indianapolis across the street and they have a completely different protocol than like my our school would. So a little strange. And um, with all that, the book came out in June. It did much better than I anticipated. I had to hustle up to Michigan and do some promotion and did that for three weeks and turned 65 and some other interesting landmark events. My wife's been telling me got an uh, education for years because she sees what it does to me. It does people are in very stressful occupation. There are many stressful occupations right now, but the education has been growing in that area in a negative way. So I said, okay, I'm done. Uh, I asked for a, a sabbatical for a month and they couldn't do it. I understand why it started school year. So uh, I raced up to Michigan two days later and I spent the last two months in our cabin in Cedar, population 800 during the winter. Uh, all, almost all Polish Catholics who are generational and have been there for 150 years, their uh, folks got off the boat in, in Good Harbor Bay, two miles down the street, and uh, there's a lot of that in Michigan. Folks who live along the coast, it's fascinating, the deep roots they have to, to the area. Um, so I wrote the book, I wrote a few pieces probably 10 years ago, but I wrote most of it during my work in schools and the pandemic. So Saturdays I was knocked out, uh, worked a lot of hours. Sundays I would finally come to consciousness and be able to write a little bit. So I realized I had 35, 40 pieces, and I went, hmm, this could be a book. And a friend of mine networked me with uh, Mission Point Press. If you're familiar with Trevor City, have you been? I went, yeah. So Trevor City has Old Mission Peninsula, which is stunningly beautiful, juts out into Grand Traverse Bay, splits it into East and West Bay. It's all uh, it's orchards and uh, wineries right now, and people have extraordinary amounts of money. It's a wonderful home series. In fact, the Wall Street Journal just did a piece on Old Mission Peninsula and the young folks with money who are moving in and thinking they're going to have a winery. So the, the pressure is really on up there, and I, and I will be talking more about that. But, um, so I did as I was told with my wife, which I've gradually learned is a good thing, um, and uh, headed up to Michigan. So for me, it's a, it's a dream deferred because. Uh, Jamie and I, when we first met each other, I started going to school in 1982. Uh, uh, I was working at the Pawnbroker's Pub, and my dear friend, who was referenced in this book quite a bit, and I were, a lot of folks that were working there at that time were in college, getting ready to bolt, and I was a working stiff. I was just working in a restaurant bar and doing well, and thought that that's what I'd be doing the rest of my life, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that uh, for people who choose that path. In fact, a little bit smarter than some of us that decided to go to school. Um, and after a grueling evening on a May weekend, it was probably it was a Saturday night uh, into Sunday morning. So it was about 3 30 in the morning. We're having a beer. We just got done cleaning up. And my buddy's getting ready to graduate from the Heron School of Art um, in Indianapolis. And we used to get a lot of really young people that would come in the bar after like 11 o'clock. They were using mom and dad's credit card and they were trainees when it came to drinking and, and you guys are familiar with Bloomington, so you know a little bit about that. Our job was to try to help them and service them and they didn't tip worth a damn, but that was just part of the program. We made our money earlier in the night and I was exhausted and I looked at Greg and I said, what is it that they have that I don't have? And he said, we're going on a field trip tomorrow. And it was like four hours later. Uh, he picked me up, he drove me to IEPY and he enrolled me in college. And uh, that's an interesting story in itself. I won't go into it other than uh, um, 
he's a crazy man. And there's reasons I didn't actually use his name in the book. I'll tell you a funny story about that. But uh, what a wonderful human being to see what he saw in me. And uh, I ended up going to college, uh, working full-time, managing a bar, a uh, young family, um, graduated with honors and in four years. So I know these things can be done, despite what other people may say. Um, and uh, off I went. I ended up teaching at IUPUI for uh, a decade or so at the University of Indianapolis and acquired three degrees. And my wife said, stop. Um, and so uh, his friendship means a lot to me. You know, and a lot of people that Jamie and I circle we have don't know that Greg had uh, done that. So um, now I have this dream deferred where I went out into the world and I worked in marketing. I've worked in a lot of different fields. I always quit before they get rid of me. And uh, so that's not on my record. And uh, um, now I have, uh, now I'm just on this grateful tour. I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that I have the ability right now to in invest in my writing. I'm working on a couple other things right now that most people don't have that opportunity in their lives. They go out and they, they work hard and maybe it's not what they really want to spend the time doing. So uh, I'm very, very happy. A friend of mine the other night asked me, you know, what, what I'm expecting to make on the book. And I said, I haven't done any projections and I'm fortunate enough not to have to care. Um, but I'm very, very grateful for the moment I'm just sitting here with you all talking about it. So that's, that's the payment uh, for me. Um, talked about meeting Greg, who I call Craig in the book. Um, and I first visit, visited Northern Michigan in 1986. Uh, he invited me to come up. It was, it was different then. There's, there's been a lot of changes in that area. Um, some of it's really good and some of it's not so good. Uh, but I was driving in from Kalkaska on M72. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's the center of the state. And you come over, you come up over a ridge and then you drop down and then you see Grand Traverse Bay. And when I saw that, it was like, wow, I thought I died and went to heaven. I, I just couldn't imagine a site like that in the Midwest. And it's just because I hadn't been to the area. I think that's an experience a lot of people have. I go, wow, this is here, it's that close. And you can see that when you start going up to Michigan's uh, West Coast, the third coast, as they call it. Uh, right away, you know, how, how, how pretty it is. But the farther north you go, the prettier it gets. Uh, and Jamie and I were talking about the UP. I've only been across the bridge once, but I was supposed to go on a bit of a tour this summer. Didn't make it, but I will be going for sure. If you've been up there, you know how beautiful it is and along Lake Superior. Um, my wife, uh, we have not taken, I mean, tell my kids this and they don't care. They don't care about a lot of things, but it's not that uh, I say, uh, we took our first family vacation when I was 40, and uh, I have grandchildren that have basically been around the world, and it just blows my mind. But and we went up to uh, Leland, if you're familiar with Fishtown, um, and we rented a house for a thousand bucks a week in 1986, because uh, it was a half block from the lake. And at that time, a busy day at the beach in Leland was probably 20 people. Now it's probably 50 or 60, and the locals are outraged. They keep themselves because <laughs> they're busy selling things, but when you get in a corner by themselves, like, oh my God, I can't believe it's like, well, you go to the beach and everybody parks at the, the trailhead, and you just gotta walk 50 yards e either way, and nobody's there. You know, it's just, it's funny. I think they're a little spoiled, but there is a real land rush on uh, right now. That's kind of funny, Tim. I just have to say, it doesn't sound like those locals know what it's like to live in Brown County in October. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, they lost some hilarious, huh? Uh, yeah, 20 or 30 people, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so when I got up there, this uh, friend of mine, <laughs> he was a car salesman for many years at the time, and he'd always get off work, play hooky. Great outdoors family. I mean, they, they were sailors for competition for sailing and hunters and fishermen and women and uh, i mean the best hunter in the family is a, a lady who's uh, 60 and is a bow hunter for deer she's the best hunter of all this gang of former military people um, so pretty serious about all that but i have some stories about my experiences uh, with some of those things um, but that's the way to experience michigan as well as many other areas of the country like this you know 
it's beautiful. We have a problem right now with children not getting out and getting exposed as much as they used to. So uh, my discovery of that area, which is continuing to this day, it's just one of, the, one of those things is like, you know, get out there because that's what we're, we're supposed to be doing. Um, we ended up purchasing jointly a, a cabin on Spider Lake and people are really familiar with Traverse City. It's like everybody in that town has lived on Spider Lake at one time or another. Uh, so we call on that. And by the way, when I, I called a, uh, an attorney, and a, a real estate attorney and an accountant who deals in real estate, and the first words out of their mouth after I told them were buying him with partners, let's talk about the exit strategy. <laughs> and they were so right, as uh, I learned the hard way a little bit later. Uh, so we bought that, and, uh, and then we backed, we backed out of it. Gosh, that was you know, 14, 15 years ago. I got out at the right time. Actually, it was, it was probably 2008 when the economy was doing some interesting things. And then I said, I'm done with Michigan, and because I've been trying to live there, and my wife won't let me. And so she went out and found a house. And uh, it's a little cottage in Cedar, and so we've been there for 11 or 12 years. And so glad she did. Um, uh, I'll show you these images. I don't know why I'm doing that. I'll have to fix it when I get home. Now, it's fun to show these images if my computer can cooperate, especially if people have it out there. But, so, this is Good Harbor Bay. Um, it's two, two miles from where our cottage is. And, you know, you don't have to have a house on the water out there because there's water everywhere. And Minnesota's supposed to be landing 10,000 lakes. Michigan actually may have more than that. And just in that area is uh, Lake Leelanau, which is stunningly beautiful. On one side of the road, Lake Michigan on the other, and there's all kinds of lakes in the area. But that's, you know, the cool thing about going to the beach, as you all know, is it's never the same every day. You know, it's always, always different. So um, yeah, that's good. Remember, bang. Let me figure out. Okay, sorry. And that's good Harbor Bay. So um, there's a really interesting thunderstorm. The, a series of thunderstorms have moved in. This is the first week in September. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, like any good Hoosier, I reported right down the beach to be near the thunderstorm. And I wasn't alone. It was about seven or eight other people. I took a bunch of photos with my iPhone. It's cool. I, I captured uh, lightning bolts with the phone. I mean, it's actually a pretty fabulous camera. Um, but I like this one because it's backlighting from from uh, lightning. And uh, another interesting thing is you can see all the debris from fire, campfires. It's just another example of there's so many people who don't really know what they're doing. They're not paying attention. And, I mean, I, you know, kids have had feet burned because they're walking across still smoldering beneath the sand. You know, it's just the rangers give you instructions, but you know how we are. Uh, that's Good Harbor Bay just in September. You know, Saw that took a picture. That would really do wonders to your prop on your boat. There's some enormous trees and, and uh, parts of wrecks that get thrown up into the water that are just destroying boats. You really got to be watching all the time when you're out on a big lake. But it's pretty when it's on shore. Uh, that's not a great photo, but one of the cool things about being up there in September and October is the migration of all kinds of creatures. And uh, you know, in mid-September, there are monarch butterflies everywhere. And they're so, I don't know enough about them, but they're, they like dance around you. They, they take a look at you. They keep, I don't know what that, that behavior is all about, but, you know, it's a human being projecting human qualities to the insect. Um, I felt like we were communicating <laughs> somehow, but I managed to catch those. They were people. probably saying, get out of my way. We're trying to migrate. <laughs> <laughs> you big man. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to know what they're. <laughs> okay. Ah, so <laughs> there. Are, I'm not crazy about Facebook, but you got to be there. So um, I have a Facebook page for my book, mm -hmm. and up in that part of the world, and I'm sure it's all over. There are uh, overheard in Leelanau County, overheard in. Grand Traverse County, over in Antrim County. So I thought, okay, I guess it's a way I can market myself. Is I just take photos of nature and post them and see what happens. 
These people go nuts over nature photos up there. <laughs> and posted that, it was incredible. There was like 100 people that commented on it. It's honeycomb coral, it's similar to uh, Petoskey stone. But I, I asked questions, I said, what is this? And there's some amateur geologists up there that really know their stuff. So that's 400 million years old, but then wow. it was amazing, the comments that I was getting. Yeah. And what's also interesting to me is 90% plus of the comments I get on the nature images I post are from women. And I find that really interesting. I don't know what's behind that. I don't know why men don't comment on that more, but every time, every time. Um, and you know, you can see that image. And I, I posted that and it was just crazy. All these people commenting because they were doing the same thing. People mm -hmm. collecting heart shaped mm -hmm. rocks. Um, that's uh, so I brought my hat with uh, Beaver Island. That's Charlotte Boy. I don't know, Jamie, you've been there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really pretty little town. We're taking the ferry. That uh, we came back from a sail, Greg and I, a 40 mile sail in seven to 10 foot waves on a 19 foot boat. I was given. I was out on Beaver Island at the library talking to them about that experience, and a woman interrupted me and said, can I comment on that? And I said, sure. And she goes, that's dumbass. <laughs> and I went, well, if you knew me back then, yeah, you'd understand. <laughs> um, the cool thing about that is after we come back from that 7 to 10 foot, I was bailing the whole way. But my friend's a great skipper. Um, we had a time so we could get his 20-foot like, mast between that. <laughs> and boy, did we want to get into the harbor that day. But it's, it's gorgeous. Um, and that's from Beaver Island in mid-September, just like I think it's uh, Hog Island, you can barely see it. Um, whoops, I don't know what's happening. But, you know, anytime you're along, every sunset is beautiful no matter where you are, if you pay attention, right? Right now in Indiana, they're gorgeous. Yeah. And so is sunrise, uh, they're nice when the conditions right. I brought some of these rocks, I was telling Jamie, I was at the uh, uh, main library in Indianapolis. <laughs> And uh, God love them. I had some homeless people that were like trying to take my rocks. One guy tried to take that piece of driftwood, which is not mine, but I took from a friend. Um, and another one's walking away with a book, but I'm kind of flattered because it's fascinating. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, that's my rock. My rock. <laughs> yeah, right there, right now. You can touch it, you can talk to it, but it's not going with you. Um, but uh, these are just some pieces that we found, most of them recently at uh, on Beaver Island. If you have a chance to go to Beaver Island, you should, because it's really a wonderful, beautiful place. 20 years ago, I was going to buy property there, and the right property at the right price is um, 18 acres for $10,000, 60% of it abutted state land, so it would never be developed. The other side, uh, to one side, was a, a corporate log cabin that was built as a retreat, so you know that was used about three times a year. And then across the street were ruins from Mormon Farm, because the Mormons had been up there. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Fascinating story about them being here. We're a lunatic leader, and uh, there's a lot of murders that happen, but uh, this is. Strange, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, chain coral. So I have some of that with me. It's my friend's favorite coral. For, as soon as he pointed out to me, I was finding it everywhere. Um, and just some fossils, and uh, that's pumice. And he says that's volcanic pumice and extremely rare in that area. Um, but you know, it's a great way to spend spend a day. It's just you lose yourself in stones. You know. Tim Fred had mentioned how funny he thought it was that you had purchased a Petoskey stone, <laughs> and then they're like everywhere that you look. That you you know that, that's like the 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 you know green tourist thing. You know, <laughs> buy a Petoskey stone. Well, at least I admit. <laughs> I had my name's there. And I had the food. But oh, as soon as my friends up there heard, I did that. <laughs> Come here, let me show you. <laughs> this is pretty cool out on Beaver Island. It is a uh, oh, what's it called? The, the glaciers push push all the stuff right, um, and it just dropped it there. And I, that's great, my friend. And I just thought I'd show you the, uh, the scale. It's suddenly just there on Beaver Island. You know, so ten thousand years ago, it's like okay, mm -hmm. you're gonna stay there for a while. Just enormous. Um, this is just a, you know, there's so many places up there. You just spend, same thing in, in Southern Indiana. Same, you know, you can just spend your life seeing new things. And somebody said, you need to go out to the Arcadia Marsh uh, Trail. And it's near Onekama. Onekama probably has 300 people live there. Although there have been some folks with money that moved into Onekama. Cool little town. 
So I got done with a talk uh, on Saturday afternoon and went up. It's a mile and a half boardwalk through the marsh. Mute swans and great blue herons were everywhere, trumpeter swans. I've never seen so many swans in my life. And, uh, you know, I just took that picture of the great blue heron. I go, wait a minute, I got to come here for migration in May because that will be something. Um, then when I got to the end of the boardwalk, there was a little stream and I saw like a, probably a 30 inch brown trout in two feet of water and you're all excited about fish. And I'm like, wow, this is like heavenly. Anyway, if you get a chance, go to the Arcadia. And uh, the folks that put this together is the Grand Traverse Regional Land Conservancy. I got to know them. Uh, they're fabulous folks, especially compared to the Leelanau Conservancy. Um, so I, in my state plan, uh, they were so helpful to me with my book. Half the writers on, that endorsed me were through the grant. They said, we can't endorse your book, but I know people who can. They're just super helpful. So uh, just from being nice, I said, goodbye, Leelanau Conservancy. Hello, Grand Traverse. And my wife and I have some money. So it's like, well, if we don't spend it before we go. That same place, I took all kinds of photos. And I just dropped this one in. So um, there's a piece about Brown Bridge Pond in the book. And it's near Spider Lake. My wife and I would go hiking around Brown Bridge Pond. It's about a 200 foot overlook into the pond. The wildlife there is incredible, especially the bird life. But there was a dam there. There's four dams in Traverse City on the Boardman River. And uh, they're all decaying at 525 years old. So they were still generating power. Uh, the Boardman Dam, I think, was uh, 4,000 people have their power and light from that dam. Um, but there was a huge discussion about do we repair them and it's going to cost taxpayers or do we pull them down and let the stream revert to its natural course. And what happened is they, they pulled them down. The interesting thing about, and this used to be the Boardman Dam was right here. So this was all pond. Uh, pretty shallow, but great to kayak on. Um, so the engineering firm they had there would gradually lower the pond and then, you know, the, the course of the water would be there. Well, it didn't gradually lower it. As soon as they pushed the button, uh, the thing blew up and the water just rushed downstream and uh, there was 40 or 50 people. Nobody was hurt, but it damaged 40 or 50 homes. They just recently, this was like 10 years ago, settled with all those folks. But this is an extraordinary place and it's really beautiful. And so in early May, I said to my trout fishing buddies, why don't we try the Borman? Because the canoes and the kayaks won't be out. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, you really want to? Said so drive 50 miles to Jordan River, which is spectacular. And we went there, went there three different times and we caught tons of fish, tons of brown trout and brook trout. So I was against that, but the river reverting to its nat natural course is the right thing to do. You know, it's just that the pond's gone, and we have our own memories of that. And, you know, everywhere along the west coast of Michigan, you can, you can see the what we're doing. Take a look at that. Uh, jump ahead a little bit. So if you go up to Michigan, Lake Michigan, you see this Mediterranean-like water now. Um, it is gorgeous, and it's getting more gorgeous all the time, thanks to the mussels, the invasive species. Oh. So the quagga mussels and the zebra mussels filter. And because they're filtering, they're absolutely turning this into just picturesque water. You can see now probably 50 to 60 feet down in a boat in Lake Michigan, you're going to be able to see even deeper because these things, you can't stop them. The problem with this and these two invasive species are they're carpeting the bottom of the lake shore of the lake. And so the fish cannot mate and drop their eggs in places that they're used to. So... There's a lot of folks, scientists are saying, we got a really big disaster coming our way with uh, fishing and commercial fishing in the Great Lakes. Um, that's why they're so scared about the uh, those crazy catfish that are now gathered around the Chicago River. We are trying to get into Lake Michigan. Um, what are they called? I can't remember. Have you seen the videos of the catfish jumping out of the yeah, water and hit people. hitting people, <laughs> knocking them out? That's Those yeah. are the fish that are waiting to get in. They were introduced into, I think, Louisiana 20 years ago. And then I think a hurricane, like what happened with the, the, uh, uh, the boas or whatever that got out in Florida during a hurricane. Well, these got out during a hurricane. And now they're all over the Mississippi River and Chicago River and the Ohio River. And they don't belong there. Do they eat zebra mussels? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be something? Let them in. Uh, this is a from 2000. I don't know what's in those 
glasses and those cups. <laughs> That's my friend Greg, the sailor. We were going out to the Manitou Islands. Um, that sail was fantastic because we went out in August. Uh, my son came with us. He was 18. Uh, he'll never go with us again. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I forgot to, uh, I wrote a piece and didn't put it in the book. Uh, we went out there during Percy Meteor Shower. And so in northern Michigan, on a good night, you can see 100, 125 an hour. Wow. And uh, Greg said, you know, uh, you may see the northern lights tonight. I said, that'd be cool. So at 3 in the morning, I'm hearing this, Tim, Tim, you got to come out here. I'm like, oh, man. I roll my head out, and the entire sky, I, I don't know if, if you've ever seen the northern lights. Yeah, yeah. You need to before you check out. The entire sky it was all green light. Uh, it could be very colored, but... And it was just shoots of light going up towards the top of the sky. And then there's like a, uh, a camera, uh, whatever you call it, the, the iris or whatever, just going like this. It's bizarre. And then the meteors are streaking through. So uh, it's all right, wait a minute. Yeah, grab a six pack and go down to the beach. <laughs> I stayed there till sun up. That was extraordinary. Um, but that was that sail. And you gotta have the obligatory fish photo. It's a, it's a lake trout, they're beautiful, they're great eating, and I hope I'm not offending anyone. Um, okay, so I just wanna show you that, give you a little taste visually, put you there. Um, I might ask you all, so are you all natives to this area? Or have you moved in from somewhere else? So, so we lived in, um, You're here in the south, so. Right, we moved here about five years ago. And where from? From Newcastle, Indiana. Yeah. Over in East Central. Yeah. Or Eastern. Yeah. So, what, what prompted you to move here? I have a sister uh -huh. uh, who lives in Bloomington and has since the 80s. Actually, my grandparents lived in Spencer. So, oh, wow. I grew up in Kettering, Ohio, near Dayton, mm -hmm. but came here often to visit my grandparents. So, I have a lot of warm feelings about oh, yeah. Southern Indiana, period. Yeah. Our yeah. kids went to IU, too, so that... Oh, well, that'll do it, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we visited them, that's all. Yeah. 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 What are you folks? I am from... I'm a Hoosier, born and raised uh, from Northwest Indiana, about the uh, Indiana Dunes National yeah. Lake Shore. Yeah. Um, or not national no, that's, park. A, that's a national park. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was very excited about that. Um, and then came down here for school and met my husband and spent 20 years and it's absolutely home now, mm -hmm. raising our son here. And, um, I totally love it. My, uh, just last fall, we went up to, um, Sleeping Bear. Oh yeah. Um, we did. Yeah. I, um, we just so you're one of those invaders. No. <laughs> right, right, yeah. we, we were three of those 50 or so invaders. Yeah. That, yeah. That big time period. But. We had the option. I gave them four choices of places to go, and that was the one they chose. And oh, cool! Yeah, absolutely loved it. It is pretty spectacular, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The uh, so when the pandemic got rolling, well, kind of, was a year and a half ago. Uh, the first April and May, the uh, rangers became very concerned because suddenly there were piles of people yeah. on the trails, and I, I had a hard time understanding that. But most of them were from downstate Michigan, and. Um, so they put up cameras and videotaped, and after a week, they shut down the park because of the behaviors of the people that were on the trails. They wouldn't distance themselves. And then we they didn't know as much as we do now, right? But, but they weren't distancing themselves. They were being reckless. There were too many of them. There was environmental impact. They closed the park for four or five months uh, for getting on the trails. Um, yeah, it is. It was pretty spectacular. Are you from this area? Um, I'm from Indy. I moved down here about a little over four years ago now. Yeah. yeah. You may not go back. No, oh, I know. The longer <laughs> I'm here, the less I go back. Oh, my. So I had a terrible time coming after two months up north. Uh, I, I'm sorry, if I didn't reference. So I stayed up uh, September and October. September is a gorgeous mm -hmm. time of year up there. And uh, I knew I was going to have a hard, harder time than normal when I got back here. I was like, my poor wife. I was foul language all the time. I'm, I'm looking at the news because I worked at the, the near east side and east side of Indianapolis. That's a shooting gallery. Yeah. Eighty percent of the shootings occurred in the area where our kids would come from. So we got to, we knew kids were killed. We knew you know these communities know each other, of course. And so when there's shootings uh, go on, oftentimes we had to counsel kids because they knew who was killed. But you know I'm looking at the 
all you got to do is look at Indianapolis, and there's six to ten shootings every weekend. They're all independent shootings, and people get killed. And last weekend, I gave my wife a really hard time. It's not her problem. I have to apologize. Um, there was a three-day ceasefire in Indianapolis declared by local uh, cultural leaders. So they want everybody to put the guns down. Of course, somebody didn't get the memo. There were a number of killings last weekend. A three-day ceasefire. What are you talking about? Is this a state that <laughs> so come to it? Zone, right. A million people live there. Most people are great, but still, there's some interesting things because I worked in an urban area. I got to witness, and and uh, it makes embracing places like you know Bloomington, and Southern Indiana, or these other areas uh, that much more visceral for me. Um, all right, I'm going to read a little excerpt from a piece. If you'll indulge me. Okay, this one's called First Light Leland. So this was the my first full day in northern Michigan many years ago. I used to be a runner. That's why I have a fake hip. So if you young people are running, you might want to keep that in mind. <laughs> go, run tra- go run trails. Don't run. Uh, and I woke up still for a run and uh, went down to the beach. So I'll just jump right in the middle of this. Once in Traverse City, we stopped at Craig's apartment. I call my friend Greg Craig. I will tell you about that. Uh, on the southeast corner of East Front Street and Wellington Street. Stop, stopping to be greeted by Uncle Craig would become an annual tradition for years to come as we made our way to Leland for summer vacation. Part of that tradition in following years would be dropping me off to have a beer or three with Craig and catch up during our yearly reunion, indulging in guy talk. But on this inaugural visit, we decided to head to Leland as an intact unit. Craig would join us later. Once we arrived, everyone poured into the house, the kids claiming bedrooms, suitcases thrown open, and a clamor for swimsuits. Matt and Corey took off for the beach just a short block away, or so we thought, as we settled in. Within an hour of their departure, we received a phone call on the landline from a local. The caller asked if the two boys jumping off the rock jetty into the Leland Harbor waters were ours. How the anonymous caller suspected them as being ours still remains a mystery. I thanked the woman, hung up, uttering a few choice words as I drove down to the harbor, catching the daredevils in the very act as they hurled themselves off the breakwaters, tons of rock erected by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the 1960s. Corey was fearless, and Matt was a loyal follower. Could have lost them both, as I explained in colorful Bobby Knight-like language. (laughs) Fortunately, despite their daring, they came home intact, and I would be keeping a close watch on them, as apparently someone was on us. Back then, I was an avid runner, keeping to an every other day routine of hitting the pavement for three to five mile runs, which by 1996, I had been doing for 15 years. I planned to be faithful to my fitness constitution while in Leland and set my alarm for a quite unvacation like 6 a.m. awakening on our first morning there. I had determined the night before that the best route would be to get out on M22 and head a few miles south to the intersection of M204 and M22 and loop back running along the winding scenic highway adjacent to Lake Leelanau. But my instincts insisted that I first visit Lake Michigan just down the street before heading out. It was already warm enough for me to run shirtless, and in those days I could get away with it without embarrassing myself or being asked to put my shirt back on. I pulled on my running shorts, laced up my blue Brooks running shoes, and jogged down Reynolds Street toward the beach, exhilarated by that dawning vacation moment on the 45th parallel and the promise of our two-week stay. I stepped down the short sandy path between the dune grass to the beach. The surface of Lake Michigan was completely still. The lake water gently lapped the shoreline as if singing a soft morning lullaby. The Manitou Islands were prominent on the western horizon, a dramatic sight to this landlocked flatlander. To the south was Whaleback Hill, a a landmark moraine glacially formed 11,000 years ago. As I peered at Whaleback, I saw two whacktail deer standing in the water along the shoreline having a morning drink. No other human was present. Normal vacationers still luxuriating in sleep. I was overcome with emotion. It was an I can't believe I'm standing here moment, a moment that recurs every time we're fortunate enough to be in Leelanau County. From Indianapolis to Leland seemed like a distance of light years. From then on, I would be frequently tempted by the thought of living there like everyone else who visits, that is, during the summer. As I would come to know when traveling up north for cross-country skiing outings a few years later, they have real winters here, and not everyone is cut out for them. 
The wave tossed stones dredged by the infinitely patient workings of this great lake over millions of years, now tracing the high tide mark in an undulating pattern, caught my attention. And for several minutes, I picked through the wide variety I would soon come to identify thanks to the inspired purchase of the Lake Michigan Rock Pickers Guide by Leland All Books later that day. For now, though, they were simply captivating to this uninitiated newcomer. When I looked up from my stone trance a few minutes later, the deer had disappeared, as if they were never there. I could feel the July heat on my now gently perspiring skin. A cold weather runner, I needed to push off to get a run in before the temperature and humidity became stifling. When I returned about 40 minutes later, having run four miles or so, the house was still, other than the collective snoring. I went upstairs to shower, careful not to awaken any of my crew. Janet had been dozing and awoke groggily sunbeams poured, as sunbeams poured through the eastern facing window above the bed. How was your run, honey? She asked sweetly, her eyes closed. Perfect, I said, sitting on the edge of the bed, looking out at the quiet Leland residential neighborhood basking in the new day's summer sun. Between the endorphins flushing through my brain and the realization of my location, I was one happy camper. You did good, Jan, I said, smiling. Really good. Better than I could have ever imagined. And we have never been the same since. So that's a little taste of Leland by my lights. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about Greg, uh, Craig. Uh, I'll jump ahead with this. So Jamie knows this gentleman. He is an artist. Uh, he's a wild child, and he's 67. He just can't go being a wild child, and I love him dearly. So, the book came out, and I got a call from him while I was up north, and he said, hey, why don't we meet at Good Harbor Bay uh, at about 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning? I said, great, because I haven't seen him in a while. I was starting my, my uh, time there. Showed up, and he's sitting there with a cigarette, and... Uh, bottle of wine, and I'm like, he goes, here, let me pour you a drink. I'm like, it's 11 o'clock, man. I got stuff to do. <laughs> he goes, no, you're going to have a drink. And so I said, okay. And uh, poured the wine and has a cigarette. He only smokes around me, he says. And he always apologizes. <laughs> I said, it's okay. You've smoked forever, and you're not going to stop, and I don't care. It's fine. And uh, he goes, I got to let you know that you broke my heart. I said, excuse me. He said, I heard a reading of one of your pieces on the library website. So the Traverse City Library records authors, and, and I got to do that. And I said, oh, the piece about Empire. And it's a little town in Michigan. And uh, the piece is about climbing a dune. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, you know, why did you have to say just negative things about me. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> he goes, yeah. You said I smoked. And I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, you said I used to sell cars. And I went, you did for 40 years. <laughs> What's the problem? And he goes, well, you had to say that. I said, oh, my God, Greg. He goes, by the way, your cover sucks. I said, my cover sucks. And he says, yeah. I said, do you do know that I approached you and asked you about 15 <laughs> other people? And you thought that was the best one that the designer came up with. He goes, yeah, you know, the biggest thing is you changed my name. And I said, sounds like that was a good call <laughs> based on the feedback I received. So um, as it turns out, he has a, a, a niece who just retired from the military, and she's uh, a psychologist and had been done a few tours in Afghanistan. Her husband's special ops just retired. They bought this really cool 150-year-old barn homes down the street that they don't know what they're doing so all the uncles are going over and helping them uh the following day heather had a party for their family and i wasn't there and he started up bragging about the book and she and there were 40 or 50 of the knock hazels there she said time out greg and she went in and got the book and read i'll read an excerpt from it about deer hunting and they're all laughing and she says you do know he loves you and he goes, yeah. So everything's fine now that he <laughs> said something. He's insane, but uh, that's great. So one thing I wish I would have done, the last piece is called uh, An Apocalyptic Friendship. And uh, the editor, I worked hard with an editor. She said, Tim, you know, I sense this was coming. You got to get rid of that last piece. And I said, I'm not getting rid of that last piece. This is very important to me. 
I rewrote it. She loved it. And uh, it's the culmination of kind of one of the threads through the book. Uh, my friend and I do not see the same way politically. We do not see the same way religiously. We do not see the same way in a lot of ways. As we've grown older, it's become very apparent. <laughs> and yet we have this friendship that is, you know, I don't know, it's 40 some years. And, uh, and so uh, we'll go out fishing and suddenly um, he's on his rant about, you know, Pelosi or, you know, now it's Biden. You know, there's always an enemy, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you're on. You know, I'll just listen to him until he hears the sound of his own voice, and I'll go, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I say, I know you. Don't worry about it. Now, give me a beer and give me another worm, and let's not talk about any of this again, because that's not what we're here for. And so my message is that I I think it's very unfortunate that we've allowed ourselves to become so... um, so angry by someone who pushed the button and was very smart about how he did that. Uh, that's been developing for a long time, in my opinion. But I, uh, my wife said, you gotta stay the hell away from me. <laughs> but you know, I, I told you the story about going to college and just invested in it. So um, I actually did lay into him after we came back from Beaver Island because he started about driving by a Catholic church and he went into a rant about the conservative young priest who went there and got ran out by all these damn liberal Catholics. And I said, I won't tell you exactly what I said. And I said, <laughs> I yelled and said, stop the truck, take me back. I can't, I can't tolerate this. He was going around on this little book tour with me. So for the first time in my life with you, I can't tolerate it. You are so hateful. You're so angry and you're so irrational. I don't care about the little Catholic church we drove by. I don't care about the conservative priest who is, shouldn't have been assigned there because the Catholic church knows that it's all about fundraising, and you want to have the right priest matching up with the right people. Come on, Greg, and on and on. And uh, so this is, this is a deeply personal book, and this is a deeply yeah. personal story. Uh, and he uh, he locked up, and he looked at me, and he said, I'm so sorry. Can we still have a nice day? And I went, absolutely. And we had a great day. But, you know, we went out fishing a couple weeks later, and it started again, but it's, it's his... Uh, Mythology, yeah. <laughs> but I will overlook it because I love them, and uh, I'm not going to let politics take this away from me. And so that's my message to people. It's really hard now. You know, my wife has a friend that I told her I am not going to their house when we go to Florida. <laughs> who's just like Greg? And she goes, uh, "Hello." <laughs> so this is hard for all of us, and, and I, I know that. Uh, but I do think, Tim, that that's one of the strong points of your book is that Greg's your friendship with him is woven all through the whole book and I know how different you are but you maintain that friendship and you just yeah. you just say okay we can't go there and then you still are friends with him and for me that's been really interesting and important to know and hear because there's just so much division that's now so much. and we you know just like we we've, we've got to figure out ways to to at least tolerate. I mean, I I hate that word in some ways. It's like tolerance is a sad word, but at the same time, it's like just the divisiveness is not getting us anywhere. You know, it's just getting worse and worse. So I I really respect the fact that you and and Greg have have maintained this friendship. And it seems to me it's much to do with you being able to just make him see himself, you know, when he's on a rant. It's easy. There are other, I mean, I won't go too far. There are other issues involved with my friend. Um, but I, yeah, it's. Uh, but it's a theme throughout the book, and I think it's important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and one, so in hindsight, the book's in print. It dawned on me. So I, I went and saw Dances with Wolves when it came out. If you haven't seen it, you should, I think. It's a good movie. Uh, might be a few myths in there that are perpetuated, but. Uh, it's a movie. So um, I saw it and I greatly loved that. And uh, I took him to it at the theater. And the the last part of it is my favorite part when uh, it's Lyndon is here, I think is the name of the character, who became a friend of uh, Kevin Costner. And um, interestingly enough, that uh, was Kevin Costner responsible for the death of his friend or involved? Well, uh, no. Anyway. Uh, the woman he was interested in was his best, best friend's uh, uh, former sister-in-law or something. Anyway, when did the hair is up on that thing, he's proclaiming, can't you see that 
you know, you're my best friend, or I'm paraphrasing terribly. And uh, I reached over to Greg and I put my hand on his arm and said, that's how I think about you. So in hindsight, I'm like, why didn't I end that story with that little bit? <laughs> I forgot. Uh, another quick uh, excerpt I'll read. This is about deer camp, and it's because that's that time of year, whether you like it or not. Uh, and uh, deer hunting is a really big deal in northern Michigan. Uh, where I come from in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which I haven't touched on yet. Uh, the, uh, I remember very vividly when I was eight years old, the house next door had a guy who shot a buck and they're carving the buck up in the front yard. That's Pennsylvania. It's, uh, kids still get out of school for deer hunting in Michigan and Pennsylvania. And it's, it's, it's uh, approved. So anyway, I was invited to go deer hunting for the first time, I don't know, 30 years ago. I'd never, never been a hunter. And this whole family goes deer hunting. So I'll jump in the middle of this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk about this cabin. We went out there about a month ago uh, to the area the family owned, um, like 18 acres in this dumpy little taka. Um, and went trout fishing and stream across. So it was fun for Greg to uh, sound mental out to be back out there with the family and gathered for probably seven years. The cabin, the Daka, rather, as Craig's family fondly, fondly called it, was used twice annually for deer camp in November and fish camp, trout camp, to be specific, at the end of April. It was the very definition of rustic. The wooden building, perhaps 600 square feet inside, was elevated off of a hillside a story or so. An outhouse located nearby made for a chilly morning constitution, more sobering than a cup of strong coffee. Otherwise, the guys typically whizzed in the woods. Or, when playing poker at night, just let it all hang out from the deck. Ah, the primitive joys of manhood. There were banners strung around, strung about the unfinished walls from fish and deer camps over the past two decades, all of them featuring logos of very li various libations, Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, and of course, the local light favorite, Labatt Blue Light. On the rectangular table that had, had seen better, more mannered days was a fifth of old granddad and a half gallon of Seagram's VO, family deer and fish camp traditions. A buck knife, stuck upright in the tabletop next to the half-eaten pumpkin pie, the clear plastic top ajar, an unopened bottle of Bailey's Irish cream next to it. Have some pie, bro, Craig invited me as he cracked the Bailey's and poured two generous glassfuls. This is it, promise, then we're out of here. Not much light left, but enough for a nice late afternoon hunt. A subtle buzz and still legal. And I must point out that they, this family is not a drinking family when it goes hunting. They're all milita former military people. But we just had to have a little taste before we went. A half hour later, we were at a favored spot near Dead Man's Hill. Over the years with Craig, I learned that spots in the woods, along a river, or on a lake matter a lot. Picking the right ones takes instinct, the right angle, the right feel, knowing the game you're after and where it, they, will likely be. To the uninitiated, it's a complete mystery. To hunters and fishermen, it's everything. Craig opened the trunk and handed me a rifle. He showed me how to load it, and then we hiked up a modest hill to a grove of cedars on the, wet, on the crest, the swamp just below us. Downhill beaver slides ending at the den and the bog hinted at the amphibious rodents' sense of delight and innovation. Destructive, clever, funny creatures they are. Northeast of us, Craig said, were deer. See the prints? He noted as he pointed to the freshly imprinted snow. Looks like three large deer went that way. I'm going to swing around and try to drive them toward you. Couple things. First, don't shoot in my direction. Got it? He said with a seriousness quite unlike him. Second, make sure you see some horn before pulling the trigger. Now sit down, stay alert, and I'll see you in about 30 minutes. I dusted the snow off a of fallen cedar and sat facing northwest, as instructed, good Catholic boy that I am, Craig too. In my hands was a 30 6 Remington, locked and loaded. My senses were overloaded with nervous excitement. Time crawled. A chickadee alighted on a branch but inches from my face, snow powder trickling onto my nose, a St. Francis up close and personal moment. I stayed completely still, enjoying the bird's curious company. After a few minutes, it moved on, and I waited. About 20 minutes after Craig marched off, as I was watching the roughly 10-foot gap of opportunity spread between stands of cedars about 40 yards northwest of my position. A large white tail suddenly appeared, walking through the target area. A second sizable deer immediately followed the first. 
Holy shit, I whispered to myself, a strange phrase of excitement, if ever there was one. Then a third adult deer trudged by, closing the column of three. Seconds later, I heard splashes in the swamp and the sound of what I would later learn was a buck on the mate for some love. Minutes later, Craig trotted up to my makeshift blind. I didn't hear a shot, dude. Did you see those deer I tried to push your way? Yeah, I enthused. They went right across the gap in the trees, exactly as you planned it. There were three of them. Craig looked puzzled. Did you see any horn? He asked. Um, not sure. What do you mean, not sure? Didn't you take a look at them? Now I was puzzled. He pointed at my rifle. Did you look through the scope? There are times in one's life when you wish you were elsewhere, at least momentarily. <laughs> Pregnant pause. Oh my God, I didn't even think about it. I revealed in complete embarrassment. Mm. Oh my God is right, Craig uttered in his big brotherly disappointment. You missed your chance. He was still panting from the exertion of hiking through the deep snow. Twilight was coming on. <laughs> well, it's times like these that there's only one thing to do. He went to a flat spot about 20 feet from the cedar cover I was under hollowed out a wide ring in the snow, gathered some firewood, and built a Boy Scout quality fire, the blaze burning away our mutual disappointment, then pulled out that bottle of Bailey's from his army issue rucksack, kept from his days in the service. Let's celebrate the one that got away. We passed the bottle back and forth for about 30 minutes until the flames flickered and died and the stars began to emerge and all was good again. Come on, let's go home and make some supper. So, I don't know if you've ever heard it, I'm a hell of a shot and terrible hunter. <laughs> um, and apparently up north, they've heard of that too. So I, I went deer hunting once more, and I, another silly thing I did, a buck ran right behind us, four of us walking down a, a two-track. And I went, wow, look at that! And everybody swung around, and then the deer was gone behind this brush pile. And Greg's older brother, Frank, turned to me and said, you don't have to do that. You need to shoot that deer and we'll know what's happening. It's just, I'm not a hunter. There's just no way. I can't, I can't shoot these creatures, but I love shooting rifles. So, last thing, uh, so I'll jump into the uh, pandemic and uh, the tourism thing that's going up north. So, I've been doing my tours all over Michigan and down the West Coast. It's fascinating. I thought only Northern Michigan was being affected by. Uh, climate refugees and pandemic refugees. It's not in Michigan. It's all along the lakeshore. It's all on pretty areas. Um, I'm going to be interviewing some people next week because it's a, a line of research I'd like to go down and do some writing about. Um, there's an explosion of people moving from the coast to get to safer areas from a climate standpoint. And I hadn't even thought about it. I was thinking about pandemic refugees, but they're a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Dempsey, you, you mentioned, he's a scientist and works for uh, for Love of Water in uh, Traverse City. It's a conservation group for the Great Lakes, so protect, uh, protects the Great Lakes. And he has some friends he wants me to talk to who moved from California to get away from the forest fires and from the earthquakes and from everything else that's going on. I was at Beaver Island uh, a month ago. Oh, yeah. And the low... The best place to go there and hear about stuff is the bar across the street from my home okay. hotel, Shamrock Bar. That's where you hear it all. And uh, yeah, okay. they had had 200 families move onto Beaver Island in the last 12 months, wow. which is a major impact on that island. The K-12 public school went from 65 kids to almost 100. Where I worked, I'm like, that can happen any day. But for them, it's a major impact. And uh, like I said, years ago, I was looking to buy property there. They, they couldn't give it away. Now every piece of property, I swear, is up for sale. And they're building very nice large homes from people who have bought property sight unseen, cash deals. And a friend of mine's realtor up there, uh, Leland, Leelanau County, the average price of a home has gone up 70% in 12 months. Wow. So it's because people are flocking, they have money, they're just throwing it out there. This realtor friend of mine says every deal, he has a phone, five phone calls within an hour of posting a nice property and they're building in contingencies that say we'll go up another ten thousand dollars above whomever he says it's the craziest year i've ever had there's not a lot of property for sale making a ton of money so there is an interesting invasion going on and what i've discovered in talking about this in my talks 
is that it's happening in all beautiful areas. And so, you know, if somebody wants to write an interesting book about what's going on nationally, uh, I'm wondering if people are moving to southern Indiana yes. to get away from yes. big city. Oh, absolutely. Bloomington, you can't get property there right now. It's wow. just, it's it's escalated in price and there's just nothing available. Huh. Yeah. So, in a dis this discussion I had at the Leland Township Library, uh, was about a dozen people there. It's the first talk I gave at the end, I made comments about yeah. this. And they were all locals and they were business people. It was the end of the work day and they knew each other and it was safe. Oh boy, did they start? It was a town hall, and they start talking about the crazy tourists and the pressures and this and that. And I said, Well, you know, to be fair, I probably started the fire, but what is it, 5% of folks that aren't behaving or 10% of the folks? Like, oh no, it's so way worse than that. <laughs> and I said, But you are making a good living. Oh, yeah, record year. We're having a record year. So the winter will be nice. But uh, one of them stopped and said, So what are we supposed to do about this? And I said, I didn't write that book. <laughs> And maybe I should, but uh, I said, you're going to have to do what my, this family did for me because I was a fudgy, which is one of the nicknames for people that are tourists and don't know what they're doing up there. But you showed me the light. I have a story about that. In, in there. You taught me about the great outdoors. You taught me how to hunt safely, how to fish, and, um, you know, how to read the weather, and how to be on a sailboat and, and really appreciate this incredible place. And you were patient with me. And that's what you got to do. These people are going to keep coming. They're going to keep coming. There's no stopping them. Uh, you can do what you can with your zoning, but you're still going to have a lot of new people. Now, when they have a real winter up there, which they haven't had in two years, that's going to, some folks will be put for sale signs up, but um, they're going to keep coming. So you have to love them. You have to be patient and you have to keep teaching them. And that's the only advice I have because what, what else is there to do? So it, it's been fascinating um, seeing what's going on up there. Uh, if there's time for uh, one more quick reading, we have to do that and end it. Maybe you have sure. Questions. Yeah, it's it's a little bit after three, so well, we don't have to. So what I would say is, it okay with you guys if he does one more quick reading and then maybe take a couple questions? And... Okay. I was long winded this time. <laughs> So this is called Before the Gold Rush. Um, I brought, so when I'm talking about my book down here, I, I wave this like when I go to Barnes & Noble and say, hey, are you familiar with this? And I go, yeah, I've seen that. And you'll never forget it now. Uh, you've probably seen these yourself. Mm -hmm. This is the branding of uh, Leland County, in particular in Benzie County. M22 is a state road that goes through there. And so clever, I'll wear this in Florida just for chuckles and then People yell at me and then we'll get into a conversation. So. Mm -hmm. The folks that own M22 are really brilliant. About 10 years ago, a couple of guys who were windsurfers, drinking wine, smoking pot, went out on the beach, went, and this is the story, um, decided that they would try to brand that. So this is not bastardized at all. You can't do it legally, but you can put it. So what I mean is you can't tamper with the colors. Of, now, some other places are doing that, and it actually is illegal. But you put it on, you get you get the rights to it, um, and they're the folks who own the rights to M22 now, and you can put it on T-shirts and beer glasses and, and all that good stuff. So, I say a few things about M22 along those lines, which I'll read to you. But I will, um, people say, "Boy, oh, you book and sell like crazy in their stores." I go, "Yeah, but they don't. They're not going to buy it after they read what I have to say." <laughs> The folks at M22, the apparel outfit that is commercially branded the Leelanau County area, just sent me and everyone else on their e email list another of their frequent promotional messages. This one is particularly interesting with its tagline, Ready, Set, Summer. It shows an attractive female model with her twisting blonde tresses draped over her right shoulder, sporting a new item, the M22 Classic Tank. She's standing in her trendy, majorly distressed blue jeans while barefoot in the middle of a two-lane road in front of a covered bridge. Most notably, she is stretching the orange tank top down to highlight the scoop neck shirt and what it contains beneath. The woman is obviously braless. Her smile radiates pure up north bliss. She must be imagining the sweet sound of cash registers going a chain this summer season as tourists swarm the M22 clothing stores in Glen Arbor and Traverse City. I get it, everybody needs to make a buck, but the M22 countryside in Leelanau County doesn't need sex to sell it. For better, and unfortunately these days, sometimes for worse, 
this special place sells itself. On Memorial Day weekend 2019, I took Janet to Empire Bluffs for a hike. We've hiked almost all the Sleeping Bear Dune National Lakeshore's official trails, but this one was new to her. As we pulled up to the trailhead, my heart sank. Wow, that's weird, I murmured, then verbalized more distinctly. The parking lot is full. I've never seen that here before. Usually there are maybe three or four vehicles whenever I've made this hike, summertime included. I kept the pickup truck idling as I looked on in disappointment, hesitant to engage the heavily peopled path. Well, it's nice that people are getting out in nature, don't you think? My ever optimistic, think the best of everyone, love wins t-shirt wearing wife replied. I didn't budge. We're here, so park your truck and let's get going. You don't have to talk to anyone but me. As usual for the past 37 years, my bride's wish was my command. We hiked the trail, passing a number of other visitors along the way. There were retired couples who passed us quietly, acknowledging our presence by smiling or gently waving as they moved on. There were college-aged and somewhat older 20-something couples who seemed to glide up the steeper grades with the eager muscles of youth. Then there were the young married with children couples exposing their online endangered children to the great outdoors. See, Janet chided me, it's all good, but it wasn't really. Here's where Janet and I differ. I didn't come here to see other humans happily enjoying their day hiking experience. I came here to get away from my species, to get far from the matting crowd I live with in Indianapolis. And there was another problem. Many of our fellow hikers were noisy. Though I tried not to catch the substance, if any, of their conversations, they yapped loudly, disturbing the peace, my peace. They brought along their unthinking, self-absorbed, clueless selves, not caring about those around them and the space they were sharing in the woods and on the black. Perhaps I'm being too harsh, too judgmental, too impatient, too crotchety, as Janet labels my okay boomer moodiness these days. Aging will do that to a fellow. A day later, two friends from India arrived to stay with us in Cedar for the long weekend, Randy and Susie. They too love being outside. Randy is quite the amateur birder and a much in demand carpenter steeped in the arts of old home and commercial structure renovation. When he retires, his humble ambition is to be a bird guy. Janet suggested we revisit Empire Bluffs as the wildflowers are in bloom, carpeting the woodland floor, and they would enjoy the dramatic view of Lake Michigan. To top it off, the woods were teeming with warblers and songbirds in full mi spring migration to their nesting grounds. As we drove up the long, steep hill to the trailhead, it was deja vu all over again with a vengeance. Not only was the small parking lot brimming with approximately 30 vehicles, but just as many SUVs, pickup trucks, and cars were parked along the road, with more streaming in as we contemplated our next steps. I uttered, uttered some choice words, adding, sorry, but I can't handle this. Let's go where they aren't. Randy concurred. I'm with you. Besides, you're driving. Say goodbye to Empire Bluffs Amusement Park, I growled as we wheeled around and headed to Alligator Hill, another trail in Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. When it came to tourists, it ended up being a much better destination, though the parking lot was nearly full, another first in my experience. I can be reactionary. When I take a deep breath and calm down in such situations, I do ask myself, who am I to judge? Yet the answer is always the same. Me, that's who. <laughs> like most Americans, I tend to want to control my surroundings, my experiences, and I'm especially picky about whom I'm sharing them with. When I'm seeking relative solitude, any outsider in my proximity who isn't playing by my rules, which includes being quiet and no idle chatter, will get my blood pressure up. I guess like, Sam, like the Sammy Davis Jr. hit song declares, I just got to be me, words and all. My life coach, my personal bodhisattva, dear Janet, keeps me working at improving my karma, however. Like it or not, she'll keep me grounded throughout our hikes, providing walking therapy for me, such as, oh, those people aren't bothering us. Live and let live. Hey, look at how blue the sky is. Check out those wildflowers, honey. Gorgeous, aren't they? I bet we could find some more morels out here. Let's look. Oh, is that an indigo bunting? There, two o'clock. If it weren't for the guiding influence of her saintly presence, I would truly be lost. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you have it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, some questions or comments? Yeah, I'd love to hear from from everybody. Well, I, we're not. Well, <laughs> I, I would make one comment. Sure. I, I first went up to Frankfurt and Point Betsy in 1950. Oh wow! <laughs> when I was a little kid, yeah, and been there probably every year since, say about five years. Yeah, that's a nice area. So have you yeah. noticed changes? Oh, unbelievable! Yeah, 
uh, resonated with me. And you were talking about 86 forward. Yeah. And well, you know, Frankfurt was a little town with three commercial fishing outfits and four ferries that yeah. came in and out. Yeah. In a real kind of an old timey harbor. Yeah. So it's now, a oh, yeah. Right. But anyway, yeah. I, we, we were just up there a month ago, and one of my favorite places is uh, Glen Haven. Yeah. Which yeah. Uh, I love that little museum. It's a lot of history there. Yeah. We yeah. went to Leland. Yeah. Town. Yeah. So Glen Arbor is close. We stayed here a couple of years. Yeah. Ago. I went to check on. They have a really nice little bookstore, the cottage shop, and I went in and they, I walked in and lo and behold, there's my book. Right as soon as you walk in, right next to Jim Harrison, I went, oh my god, you got a book. That's just, that's way too flattering. I don't belong next to Jim Harrison. Uh, they were really sweet, but the scary part was I had never seen Glen Arbor that busy in the middle of summer. It was insane, and uh, this must have been on half the people that were there. Yeah, the stores right there. Yeah, yeah. Too. So you went up at a good time. Yeah, it's after most people cleared out, but it's not completely clearing out now. It's uh, much different. I mean, Leland was sleepy when we went. And started going there. It's, yeah. it's not sleepy right. anymore. It's sleep Typically yeah. on Labor Day, or the day after Labor Day in Leland. It's a ghost town, not, not anymore. It takes about, about a month for it to die down, and the color tour started. So, mixed blessing, right? Yeah, right. Anyway, great. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things you said resonate with me. Good. It's good. Yes. Really good to get to hear your, your story. Oh, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. I get to talk about me. You know, one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> it's my wife to confirm. <laughs> She's not here right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so yes, much, thanks, Tim, and thanks Very everybody much. for coming. Um, we do have a book club on the second Thursday every month, so we'll, you know, keep keep your eye out. I do a monthly newsletter, and you can see what's going to be featured. And we generally have the book for sale, and we do have more of Tim's books for sale today. So, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I also enjoyed your comment about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, were you really? Yeah. Well, then, well, I was writing about my little brother. Uh, he's yeah. a, he's a, there's another piece of here. Six eight by the black belt. Instead of boarding in the theaters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Really. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, you too. Jim, thanks for coming. Well, I'm sorry we were a little late. Oh, not to worry. It's good to see you. Uh -huh. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, I owe you a signature. You owe me a signature, yeah. And I bought one of your books, and you owe me a signature. Oh, really? I know. Thanks for coming. Well, didn't come down. Uh, well, you know, I talked to him last night, uh, and I told him that you guys would probably be here if he wanted to come. But, uh, his brother, uh, uh, Marty. So Marty's been hospitalized. Uh, he's got blood clots that I think the aunt said he followed. So Marty had COVID. And they think that this might be related to it. And uh, they uh, I think he's at AFib. So he should be out in a couple of days, but the aunt is working on a project right now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we to miss him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dan's doing good. Dan yeah. sounds really good. Well, uh, he's watching you be alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some days I go, I don't want to be here anymore. But, you know, that's a terrible thing to say. Well, you just got to say, give me, give me patience so I don't kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about how the community has grown up there so quickly. And so much. It's too concerning. Where we live, we are eight miles from Bloomington, 19 or 20 miles from Spencer, 10 or 12 miles from Ellisville. And you see these new neighbors come in, buying places. And they got a nice car, no jumpers, no four wheelers. 
And the first thing they do is they forget that they were scared of the dog. And then they've got their little precious pets that they forget to get If it's a tiny one, we have nine dollars, drink dollars, and we've got the coyotes. And they also hate the fact that their road is a paved in concrete. And so their road is just a country atmosphere. And I'm thinking, if you miss all of that, sorry, we couldn't have to go back to your comfort. Don't ruin our comfort. It's a huge issue. It is. And, and they come in and not. That's part of what I talk about up north is okay. appreciate the locals and the folk ways of people who <laughs> started up with dragging from Indianapolis yeah. down south up to Michigan. You know, appreciate them and then it'll all work out much better and you'll learn something. Yeah. 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 Review is on my computer, so I'll just send it to yeah, you. Okay, yeah. great, and thank you for doing that. Thank you, too. So, I should have asked you before. Jamie's moving all my stuff around. So, I have not read this one. Oh, it's a big job. <laughs> People speak about getting a book that they look down. Here's one you can hardly pick up. It took me six years to go out there. That was kind of a. Mm -hmm. The commemoration of Lewis and Clark. Yeah. Well, to have that. that uh, yeah. Love that idea. Yeah, it's, 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 no, you can't. They can't ignore no cool title like that. <laughs> no, not if you're us. <laughs> yeah, I did this telling Jimmy. I just, I, just, uh, I just got back from Ann Arbor yeah. and Detroit doing a, just kind of a trip checking on libraries and bookstores. I had never been in Detroit. Yeah, it was fascinating. So I went down on the river walk and there was all these abandoned manufacturing plants, but then they're trying, you know, doing some interesting things. But I went to this place called the Outdoor Indoor Center, and the DNR has put that together. And it's really for kids to look at them outside, it's all that up north. So I thought maybe they like it. It was all just decimated war zone. These young white women bringing their little kids in from suburbs. And then, so I, then, I went to the suburbs. And I went to the ones that people told me were the high dollar amounts, you know, to the libraries. And it's like never, never, man, you're so beautiful. And then we go down to town, and then we go to nine days. This is crazy. That's what happens with economics. Yeah, for sure. These stones are Yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah. a tank core. <laughs> yeah, my best friend, yeah. a couple months ago, I was with him. He's, uh, a couple months ago, we were out looking for rocks and goes, oh, chain coral, that's my favorite. Oh, it was really hard to find. Two minutes later, I found one the size of my fist that was perfectly defined. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So we found a bunch of them up on Beaver Island, and that's just yeah, awesome. I've been a classifier forever. Oh, God. Well, you're living the right place, yeah. aren't you? Well, I came so from Southern Ohio. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, my, my grandfather in law was a Church of the Nazarene minister. Great guy. He always wanted to save me. I let him save me one day. My, my wife told me, I can't believe my grandpa do that. He was old, he's been working on me for 30 years. I want to do him a favor. But he showed me a film uh, of the uh, 
Mountain Collins are rushing with uh, oh, this evangelical PhD who says, you know, the earth is 10,000 years old. But, you know, yeah. these are 400 yeah, exactly. million years old. Oh, yeah. science, right? Yeah. So I get really excited just touching something. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think my father lived in Ravenswood, West Virginia, on the other side of the river. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, here, you uh, there are five rivers that we enjoy in Miami. Yeah. And so. So they decided the best way to keep that from happening was to create a so far, and I would go out, and I was closest to Huffman and Taylorsville, and I would go wood dropping and looking for fossils. She's one of the I'd come home. Foxes. I love rocks and I love foxes. Me too. My, my wife tells me you gotta return those. I mean, you get returned some Yeah. Right now I'm just I don't know how to keep keeping them. Well, <laughs> called green. When I was green. about fourteen, my mom and dad moved to Oregon. Yeah. And they were in Oregon. They moved to my dad was moving my stuff and he said, daughter, I don't care who you marry, as long as he treats you well. Oh, yeah, I know that. He'll live yeah, these half a I've yeah. seen it, yes, of rocks, because this is the last one I'm talking about. This was... We better marry somebody with a big back. Yeah, I've seen that. But well, you did. Yeah. Painting that it inspired. Well, first one was right. 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 He was a poetry yeah. and uh, anything that you would know. And he was yeah, composed right. around art. That was from the Greeks. Yeah. Oh, wow. If you flip it over, I was walking down the middle of the creek and I saw that. I, you I flipped it over and then you tried to explain that. I went Jenkins to your own. The rest of them were right. yeah. oh, okay. That's from your yeah. 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 We call Chiefs. This is the court chair. I was into the size of the of uh, uh, This piece yeah. for them. Oh, so yeah. And we called it Chiefs because they were so difficult to um, find. I never yeah. heard of Chiefs. Yeah. speak in that tone of well, voice. We found yeah. 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 Oh, oh yeah, we do that forever. It's a that's the Tracy. It's the same family. I wouldn't know her. It's about twenty-five years. Well, she's been here. I actually bought one of those oh, college first time I went up there. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Friends there we go. You really don't have to. He had a piece called. Uh, Think like a mouse. Uh -huh. And she wrote a tone poem yeah. that went with that. Uh, oh, wow. Telling Jamie I gave her a presentation at the very, very well. Or I did give a presentation at the, uh, the, the main library in Indianapolis upstairs. One of the libraries they invited. And I had this display. Reading of his stuff. Almost people were trying to take my stuff. I forget. That is my art. But you know, it was, it was cool that they were fascinated. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sorry, I'm so exhausted by the time we get up there through all the traffic and stuff. Oh, yeah. But, it's so bad. But the, the moment the music started, it was starting to get better. It started to get better. It's just a little bit lazy. Oh, that's over 90 degrees. And I saw that lady get more beautiful. And they didn't take water out there, I think. Huh? They both aren't just the idea. Oh, yeah. That's dangerous. And uh, I, next day, I told uh, Ransom the other day that lesson was not going to be I don't believe that he gave his name. She says she just looks like a stunning woman. And I'm saying, I'm not going to be It's crazy. Uh, yeah. You just see what's going on inside and out. Hey, Tim, I want to take a picture of you and Jen and the Ten Rings, if you, if you don't mind. And I'm sorry, Daddy. And they oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. Both my kids. I was excited to see him because I've seen him for a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen him. So it took me, I think, the last one. So yeah. Yeah. So three months in rehab, and he's still. We want him to write this down. Or, I know I'll be able to take a picture. Okay. I saw you, you fluffed up the, the count on those pants. Oh, yes. Skirt. Yes, I did. I just, I, I just I got did. them in. I just got them in. Good. Yes. I intend to relieve you of a couple. <laughs> okay. Well, Lisa, will you take, when, when they're, when we do it, will you take a picture of the four of us? I would like that. Just pop it in to see if you want one of Yeah, I, I don't think okay. I we have one. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tim. It was really wonderful. That was a blast. Yeah, it was really good. You did a great job.